Thank you, Mark. Welcome, everyone, for this session. Um, so it doesn't come as a surprise if I say that the Middle East region suffers from low growth and high unemployment. How do we lift growth, create jobs, <coughs> promote fairness and inclusiveness, and diversify our economy? See, these are some of the questions that we're going to be discussing today. And joining me on this panel are two very well-esteemed speakers, which I don't even need to introduce. But first on my left is Fadi Randour. Fadi is the founder and vice chairman of Aramex. He's currently executive chairman of Wanda Ventures and managing partner of Mena Venture Investments. He's a member on several boards. Um, also, one is the Abrash Capital and also Endeavor Global, member of the Advisory Council of the MIT Media Lab, and the Board of Trustees at the American University of Beirut. He's also a founding investor at Maktoub.com, which was sold to Yahoo in 2009. He's the founder and chairman of Ruad for Development and chairman of Ruad Micro Venture Fund, an equity-based fund <coughs> providing seed capital and support for micro businesses and micro ent ent entrepreneurs. Left to, to Fadi is another Fadi, which I'm going to suffer definitely introducing both Fadis. <laughs> um, Fadi Majdalani is a partner at Strategy and previously known as Booz and Company. Fadi is a lead partner of several practices within Strategy and one of which is family businesses in the region. He also has 21 years of experience in consulting, and three of which are in private equity. He used to sit on the board of Booz and Company, also sits on the board of Endeavor Lebanon has an MBA from the Harvard Business School and master's from MIT in engineering and a bachelor from the University of Beirut also in engineering. Welcome both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps we can start our discussions with both Fadis sort of sharing their insights at a high level of the issue at case, low growth, high unemployment. Um, so I think let's put this discussion into, into a bit of uh, context, maybe starting with some, uh, some high-level numbers. I mean, the, uh, the region, and by region, I mean the MENA region, has been growing at uh, 4%, which is a decent growth rate, but certainly less than what we see in other uh, emerging markets. Now, when you couple that with population growth of 2%, which is double what we see in, uh, on the average in the world, this already starts showing that there are some strains um, relating to actually creating uh, enough growth opportunities for, for all the upcoming people into the job market. And to put that into, into perspective, uh, the MENA region has to create 75 million jobs in the last decade, i.e. 40% more than the total jobs that we have today. So that's, that's really uh, the challenge out there. Uh, maybe another set of numbers when we think of unemployment uh, in the region. Uh, today, unemployment in the Middle East is around 28%. That's as per the International Labor Organization. And in North Africa, it's uh, around 24%. Now, these two numbers are the highest in the world. And when you look within that segment of the unemployment rate of women within that, uh, that is almost double. So big, big set of issues. Now, um, why do we need to think about solutions to that problem? Um, I mean, uh, maybe two fundamental reasons. One is, in the past, um, governments tended to actually resolve the problem by absorbing a lot of the manpower and people coming to the job market onto the government payroll, in one way or the other. But clearly, that has now maxed out. The government doesn't have the ability to hire all these people coming to the job market. <coughs> and the other reason we need to do something about it is it has become clear that while you were able to manage unemployment from a social perspective, the latest set of revolutions, up uprising that we've seen in the region clearly indicate that we've also maxed out on the abilities of the population to accept the, the status that uh, they are living in today, uh, especially those that are unemployed. So you need to think of what to do. And um, uh, the solutions you know, at a high level are very different when you think of the region because in the region, we, we do have a different a difference between the countries of the region. I mean, when you think of the Gulf as one set of issues, and when you think about uh, Levant and North Africa as a, as a different set of issues. Um, so the problem is the same of unemployment, but the issues are very different. In, in the Gulf, the, uh, the real issue is, of course, you need to grow and create more jobs, but uh, only a few number or a small percentage of your nationals are currently employed. Uh, out of the total population. So take the example of Saudi Arabia, you're talking about 15 to 20% of the overall population, uh, employed population is Saudis, 
which means that part of the problem there is how can you actually create an environment where Saudis replace expatriates? That's in the private sector. That's in the private sector, yes. The government sector is almost 100% uh, nationals. So in, in the Gulf, in the Gulf in particular in Saudi Arabia, which is the largest part of the Gulf, I mean, the, the real issue is, you know, what do we need to put in place in terms of um, mechanisms, policies, and what have you to encourage the replacement of expatriate workforce by national workforce? Uh, in, the, uh, in the Levant and North Africa, it's a totally different set of issues because over there, there is no displacement. Over there, you actually need to create a net increment of, of jobs. Uh, and, and so that brings to the table a whole set of what the government should do to create the environment for entrepreneurship to flourish and for new companies to be set up and businesses to grow. Um, maybe let me, let me stop here. Uh, uh. Did you have a question or do you want no, me to I follow up? Follow up on that and then I'll ask my question. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to add, uh, I, think, I think what Fadi gave was, is, is, is comprehensive, obviously. Um, the key, when, when you want to talk about entrepreneurship, about job creation, about the advent, the massive advent of young, uh, educated people uh, that are going to come to the job market, we need to think about uh, what is it that they're going to do? So when we talk, uh, let's talk startups, let's talk businesses. The Arab world, the biggest problem, I think, in the Arab world, other than the education system that is, is giving skills to these kids that not, don't, don't necessarily match the job market. The other problem is there are no markets. So we have a fragmented market system. Uh, so we talk about the Arab world, but the Arab world is 22 countries. Uh, uh, we, uh, th uh, theoretically, it's a, uh, it's a three and a half trillion dollar, uh, four and a half trillion dollar economy on purchasing power uh, purpose uh, calculation. Uh, bigger than India, bigger than, uh, than Russia, bigger than, uh, than, than some of the BRIC uh, BRICS uh, countries. Yet, uh, the reality of the matter is, is it's small. So the businesses that are coming out are small. They're not able to sell their products. There is no mobility. That, that's one. The other one is also mobility across markets. So you can't, you're not, you're not mobile. Uh, you're, uh, the, the entrepreneurs and companies are not mobile uh, either. The biggest challenge I see today by some of the startups that, that I work with is they're not able to set up their businesses uh, across borders and uh, for, for limitations and restrictions that I have yet to even understand. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the infrastructure, the soft and hard infrastructure in the, of the Arab world, some of it is, is of fantastic excellence and some others are, are really at low level. Uh, the road system in the, in the region is uh, connecting. Connecting the cities of the region is, is not great. We have <coughs> customs issues. Even though the GCC has, uh, and I was talking to some Saudis yesterday about it, the GCC has a customs harmonization agreement amongst each other, and there's a customs union, but yet try to, try to, uh, to clear a package through customs uh, from one Arab country to the other today and see what happens to it. Uh, 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 entrepreneurs that uh, 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 want to have an ease of entry to the market and ease of exit to the market, so registration, uh, uh, quick, uh, uh, quick licensing, it just takes months. So some countries will give you statistics that are not accurate, don't believe it. It takes months to set, uh, to, to set up uh, businesses. And it's quite, uh, quite an impossibility to actually exit the market, meaning exit, not, not selling. If you fail, you're going to go to jail, maybe, uh, because <laughs> there is no bankruptcy law. So it's it's uh, so these are so basic issues. I mean, we're not talking about here very sophisticated uh, issues and challenges. These are issues that many other countries have faced, they have addressed, and they have resolved. And I don't see why uh, the Arab world, which has been talking about uh, an Arab common market long before the Europeans did, since World War II, actually the Arab League, the first issue on the table of the Arab week, some of you might not know, was the Arab common market. Long before they talked about uh, joint uh, uh, political, addressing the political issues, the biggest agenda was always back in the, in the early 50s. How do we actually create an Arab, uh, an Arab common market? And you know where the Arab common market is today. So, uh, I mean, so we need to move from talk to implementation to addressing the priorities that the Arab world has. So while the Arab League continues to meet and discuss to address political issues and they fail miserably at it, 
they leave the biggest challenge to the Arab world, which is not necessarily politics, but how do we empower and how do we bring our kids from, from, uh, from aspirations of studying, for people like we see here, and, and I've met several fantastic people here, how do we actually get them to feel that they are going to come and become productive in the job markets in the region? I mean, that's, that's the main challenge. So growth is there, but we need to grow with, with, with the youth. Again, the 75 million, 100 million, dollar, million jobs that are required in the, in the next 10 years is at the current, if, if you assume that the current unemployment rate remains the same as it is today. So this is an extra to the endemic uh, unemployment rate that we have today. Great, so, so I think what's clear from both of you that what you're telling us is that, you know, despite the fact that per capita has been growing a bit, it's mostly through demographics, there's very low productivity, right. and the private sector is sort of not creating the right jobs, if you want to say. If we, and you know, clearly from what Fadi is, sorry, sorry, it's hard to say which Fadi. Um, so Fadi has. Fadi G. <laughs> Fadi G and Fadi M. <laughs> I mean, Fadi M has highlighted that pretty much it's the private sector now that can only have some sort of leeway for creating these jobs. But what's also evident from Fadi G <laughs> is that um, you know you need to create some sort of an inclusive growth. And we looked at some of the numbers, which is you know, women's labor force participation is at 22%. Right. How do you create with the private sector an inclusive growth, whether through family businesses or through entrepreneurship? It's a, it's a big question. I mean, how do we include uh, inclusive growth when, and so I have to be very sensitive because uh, business and politics in the Arab world mix uh, uh, unreasonably. Uh, so, but I'll, I'll talk, and uh, you're all smart people. We're at Harvard, so you will get what I'm trying to say. <laughs> uh, when there are uh, restrictive laws and restrictive cultural norms that do not allow women to participate in the labor force, it's very, there is very little that the private sector can do, in one sense. Uh, even though there is, well, women are 50%, 50 percent of women in, in colleges, uh, 50% of our graduates, if not higher than 50% of the graduates of the Arab uh, world, are women. While their participation is what you said, 18% across the region, and it varies. It varies even in liberal countries. So my country, I can, I can talk a bit freely about that. In Jordan, it's the same. So we, it's, it's, uh, there is not necessarily a cultural or a legal barrier for women to participate, but Jordan is also at 18% which I think is, 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 is ridiculous and needs to be studied very carefully so that we understand why is there such a massive lag. And this affects productivity, it affects, gro it affects growth of the economy. There is a, a massive section that is not participating in the economy. So we need one to, if there are laws and if there are cultural issues, then it needs to be embedded in the education system, not in, in, in terms of, of the, the, the education of the students, but education of the families and education and, and purposefully work at changing the cultural barriers towards the participation in the labor force and address them honestly. I mean, there is a shyness about addressing the challenges of participation of women. In the, we, we are afraid there is something. Why should we be afraid of it? If it's religious, then let's address the religious issue. Where in Islam does it say women should not be participating in the labor force? If somebody can, can show it to me, uh, 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 let's discuss it at least. Women in the very early days of Islam, imagine that 15, 1600 years ago, were, were much more active in, in, in Iran. They have a high uh, active workforce, uh, uh, women. Uh, work. So we need to address these challenges and we need to be honest about them and we need to talk uh, and find solutions for those. Uh, uh, and this needs a... This, so I'm... I'm not trying to, uh, uh, these are serious issues here. And this, <laughs> this requires, this requires, this requires a public, private, civil society, inclusive discussion and debate. So I'm, I, can, I, can, I can pretend to know the answer to you, but I don't really know the answer. I know that there is no discussion about it. There is no serious discussion about it. There, we, we discuss issues in the Arab world in silos. The public sector discussed it in silos. And even in the public sector, they don't talk to each other cross-sectoral. So the Ministry of Economy would want to encourage people to actually build businesses, while other ministries will tell them, who says you can actually encourage people to build businesses? <laughs> We're not in the business of doing that. So there is, and I can talk generally across the region. 
there is no cross-sectoral discussion about the serious issues, let alone bringing in the private sector or the entrepreneurial society into the discussion. It is, it's a challenge. It's a big challenge. Why don't we bring the private sector? It's not only the public sector that prevents the private sector from coming in. There is a shyness. There is a timidity in the private sector in being vocal in coming out and addressing the challenges that we have in terms of what the skills we want, in terms of being inclusive. We don't, we're, we're, we're shy. We are worried. There is, and this has nothing to do with, with the democratization process that, mm. that we have. We, uh, we tend to think of ourselves, and this is a global issue so that we're not thinking of the Arab world only. This is a global issue. We think about our own performance as, organiza uh, as organizations, independent of our impact in society. We think of our profitability, and we say, yeah, akhi, somebody else has to address this issue, and I, I am focusing on my thing, and yalla, the proof. I mean, this is the truth. Uh, 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 why should I be involved if, if I'm going to get criticized, if I'm going to get hurt by the public sector for, for anything that I'm doing? If I'm dependent on government contracts, then I'm going to be completely silent, because why should I care if I am living off of, of certain uh, public contracts. So there is no activism in the private sector so that they can step up and say, we need to be part and parcel of this discussion. Otherwise, there is a huge section of society that's missing from the debate. Civil society in, in the region, and we were uh, earlier listening to uh, our friends at the culture and, and art session, there is a disconnect also. So that's part of the discussion. There's a disconnect from civil society in coming up and discussing. So discussing these issues in a partnership manner. The region cannot have these silo discussions independent of, of each, each of us coming to the table and saying what the issues are and how we can address these solutions uh, as if we all strategically care about the free future of the region. There is a distrust uh, at, at this stage, and that's why we are not around the table. You know, I, I actually uh, c confirm that the, the solution is not that easy. I mean, we've, uh, we've recently done, done research on women issues uh, in the region. Actually, we, uh, we run some surveys and we interviewed a lot of women to understand, uh, especially in family businesses, to understand why they are not more forthcoming into the workforce and wh what's happening. And actually, you know, as, as Fadi mentioned, uh, a lot of it is, is not legal. A lot of it is, uh, you know, the parochial nature of our uh, societies uh, and the fact that uh, they actually have to fight in the house much more than ha they have to fight outside of the house to, to, to get to, uh, uh, to, to where they want to get. Now, having said that, I, I, do, I do see, however, uh, that there are, uh, at least within cities or, or, or countries, some uh, elements of a starting of a discussion in the, so, in the, in the uh, civil society. Uh, now, we're not there, obviously, but, but clearly the, the discussions is starting. And, and I think that the change that in the trend of life that, that we're seeing, uh, which is that uh, you know, women tend to start, uh, um, you know, first of all, the, the size of families is getting smaller. Uh, and uh, women have more years to actually get trained in business and economies and, and participate in, in, in social activities before they actually uh, get married. This is helping uh, to increase, if you want, uh, that, uh, that the penetration of women in the workforce. But this, it's a long way to go. Tadichi. <laughs> So uh, you talk often about you know, corporate entrepreneurship responsibility and the role right. of the private sector in driving entrepreneurs. Right. Um, how do you find this working, particularly in countries like the Levant and the, you right. know, and the North Africa, where there's no presence but for SMEs as a solution? And, 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 and it's not only in uh, Levant and North Africa. Across, there's a, mis a misunderstanding that the Gulf is, is about big companies, because we only hear about the stories of big companies. Uh, SME sector in, in the Gulf is also the largest sector uh, in the economy, and, and we need to recognize that. Uh, it's not about the Aramcos or the Aramexes or the Ahmars or the Emirates Airlines. It's about these SMEs that are jo uh, creating five and ten jobs or, or, or three or four jobs. I mean, the retail sector is like that. If you go to Dubai, if you go to downtown Dubai in Dira, you will find a massive amount of people employing two or three people. But uh, so my, 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 the, my thinking always about the responsibility of companies is uh, uh, how do we get, how do we move from, uh, from the PR side of CSR, of corporate social responsibility, and, and feel good uh, uh, initiatives to, to strategic 
uh, engagement of the private sector in, in solving the issues uh, that we face. And, and I say the biggest issue that we face as we have been talking today is about jobs and job creation. And there is nobody better than the private sector to actually address the, uh, the, the question of entrepreneurship and job creation across, across the region. So, and thus the corporate entrepreneurship responsibility. So move from CSR to CER. And there are several things that the private sector does as a, as a matter of nature. Uh, in terms of, of, of how it can help. So from internships uh, to, uh, to access to capital, uh, to, uh, to mentorships. I mean, these are all simple things. And we had earlier uh, uh, Rania talking about, uh, about how she can engage in some of the things that Jusur are doing uh, for internships and for education. So the private sector is prime for that. You don't need to do much. It's, not, it's, it's bringing these people into your organizations and actually helping them grow so that they, once they graduate, they hit the ground running in terms of, of, of finding jobs and, and getting used to the, to the there's a, a big lack of an internship culture across, uh, across the region. And I think that is one way of actually helping these guys uh, take their education into practice before they graduate. And then once they graduate, they, they, it becomes much easier for them to be employed and gain the skills uh, uh, in, on, on action. Now, going back to the, to the SME sector, uh, by small, I mean, one of, the, one of the most obvious things that we talk about in, in corporate entrepreneurship responsibility is by small. Why, why is it that we're, we're procurement, if you're a big company, then have a policy uh, or have a culture inside of the, orga the organization that, uh, uh, that gets you to go out and find the small and medium-sized enterprises or the entrepreneurship or the startups or the entrepreneurial companies and the startups and buy from them. This is how they will exist. This is how they will survive. And this is how they will create jobs. Uh, simple things that you don't need to think about uh, other than in, in engaging in what you already do, but opening it up to the society that you touch every day. Tati M, I know you hit the practice on, on family businesses. And we know that in the GCC, three, four of the private sector, on the non-oil sector, are actually family businesses. How do you see the role, not only in terms of job creation, but also driving sort of the economic performance going forward of most of these economies? What has been the current role, and how do you see it you know, going forward? Of family businesses. Of family businesses. OK. Look, I mean, uh, I think family businesses are, um, are an essential uh, part of uh, of the economic landscape that we have there, uh, and um, and I think you, you need to look a bit of uh, they're they're all going through a big transition now for a number of different reasons. I mean, th these the family businesses uh, have most of them have been started, I would say about 50 years ago. This was the time when you know post Second World War you started seeing the economies of the region starting to, to, to take off with oil discoveries and the old wealth uh, c coming uh, to them. And at that point in time, uh, there was a big, big lag of, um, uh, you know, uh, institutions providing financing, providing people development and talent development, providing um, um, certainty and reputation for international players who want to do business in the region, uh, and providing access to, 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 to capital through banks, which we're looking at back then into reputation lending, because you did not have the rating and the scoring systems. Yeah, yeah. So all of that created an environment where actually family businesses uh, were, were right to take advantage of it. And the entrepreneurs among them did extremely well. Those that went in and became the trusted advisor of international players, the, uh, got the money from the bank, acted as the venture capitalist, and acted as a private equity player, and started growing all these, uh, these conglomerates. Now, fast forward uh, today, what's, uh, what's, happening, what hap what's happening now is a number of things. Which, um, which are going to lead to these family businesses uh, needing to actually um, kind of self-reinvent themselves. Okay? So what's happening? On, on one side, um, 50 years into it, you are now passing from the second to the third generation in these families. And you know, uh, you know, just maybe a small statistic here, 11% of family businesses survive the third generation. OK, so the odds are against them unless they actually re reinvent themselves. This is in the region or global? Global. 
global. Um, and um, so that, that's kind of the odds of the family succession, if you want. But beyond that, what's happening is the markets have become much more open. You have much more transparency than you had before. Uh, you have a talent market out there that is much more developed. And so when you put all of that together, kind of the traditional basis on which these companies were uh, established uh, and, and the reasons for their existence is, with time, becoming less and less important. Now, are they going to disappear? Certainly not. I mean, they still have a huge role to play. They are very much implanted. They, have, they own the networks of these, of these countries. But clearly, they need to really reinvent themselves. They need to, uh, uh, to, to basically uh, think of uh, not only that they are the natural uh, recipient of all the goodnesses of the economies over there, but they need to start fighting for it because there's much more competition. So can I add uh, something to that? I think the institutionalization of management away from ownership is quite, uh, quite an important element in, in moving family businesses uh, from depending on only a few, a small talent pool because of inheritance uh, or of because of succession and to make it a bigger talent pool so that you bring in the professional managers and, and separate management from ownership. That's, that's, I think that's, that's quite important in terms of the survival beyond, because second generations and third generations and uh, cousins coming into uh, the business, you get a different, uh, and I've seen it with some of the friends. We've seen some major companies in the Gulf that have disintegrated. Uh, even in, in, in Lebanon, there's a big, uh, there's a big uh, company in Lebanon that does not exist anymore because of, uh, of different, it has nothing to do with anything. It has to do with, uh, with a generation that came to inheritance or to succession that did not feel that the continuation of the vision and mission and, and the purpose of that company made, uh, made any more sense and wanted to cash out and then thus fights. So if there is going to be a continuation and the founder or the founding uh, members want to keep the company as is, then they, they, you need to create that separation and, and that governance process that makes sure that the, the, the f f successive generations do not have the power to actually act uh, in a manner that is destroying for value rather than building value of the same organization. And maybe let me build on that. And, and the way this, this kind of links to the entrepreneurship and uh, active discussion and the role of family businesses to spur entrepreneurial uh, opportunities. Um, and again, this is more on the GCC uh, side of things. Uh, the rate of growth of the family, so the number of family members and the growth of the families, is actually faster than the rate of growth of the companies. Okay? <laughs> which, means, which means that on average, the wealth per person is going down. And, and the, the families can, can realize that, okay? And, and for them, if the objective is that they want to maintain um, uh, the same kind of lifestyle for the next set of generations, they absolutely need to develop the next set of entrepreneurs in their families and support them to actually get out of the family business and start businesses in parallel to actually grow the wealth of the, of the families. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm going to turn actually to the questions from the audience. One that is coming up with the high score is how do you encourage young and successful Arabs around the world to return to their countries and help rebuild and improve rather than simply sending money to their families and playing it safe? Yalla, <laughs> 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 uh, so don't watch CNN. <laughs> uh, certainly don't watch Fox. <laughs> and the region is actually, well, so we, we are, by nature, we need to, talk, to discuss our issues and to discuss our, cha to discuss our challenges and, and bring them out to, in, in an honest manner. Uh, but let me talk, uh, let, me, let me put a positive story here just a little bit, despite of what's happening in Syria, despite of what's happening in Iraq, if, if there is a despite. So uh, excuse me if I'm offending you by saying despite, but I have to say that uh, because we need to uh, also 
uh, give a complete picture of what's happening in the region. So ISIS is not dominant in the region, regardless of what you hear about it, OK? <laughs> we actually can walk on the streets and, and in many. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, uh, if, if you get to listen to, uh, to, uh, to the stories, we're, the, the only story that's being talked about today in the region, and, and historically, ever since I remember building my business, is that, you know, we, it's, it's not safe. Uh, it's, there's terror here. There's, and now, now it's as if we walk in the streets and we're worried that our necks are going to, to vanish. Uh, <laughs> we, we countries, I mean, if you take Jordan and Lebanon, all right, the two most affected countries by the neighborhood around them. Okay, Syria, Iraq, uh, uh, Lebanon, Jordan, we have a million people in both countries in Lebanon. The question that should be asked is not what is happening to, what, why is, is, is Jordan unstable or is Lebanon unstable? The question should be is why is it that they are stable? Why is it that they are not uh, being structurally th uh, threatened now? Yes, they have issues, but why are they surviving? Why is Lebanon a sectarian country, with all due respect, and my origins is Lebanese, and I will say it very clearly, a sectarian country built on a sectarian system with a formula that says for every Christian there's a Muslim and for every Shia there is a Sunni, okay? Why did it survive when you had a million different sects coming to Lebanon? It survived, there are some clashes here and there, but the, 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 the state survived. So there is a certain resilience to it, and we need to think about it. I'm, I'm not gonna claim that I have an answer now, but that's what we need to think about. OK, so there are now, leave those countries. In fact, Jordan and, and Lebanon still had economic growth. They're not 3 and 4%, but they're 1 and 2%. Again, we need to also discuss that. There is high uh, debts of, uh, high percentages of debt, but that's another story again altogether. If you go to another part of the region, the Gulf is thriving. The Gulf, as if it is dissociated from the rest of the region, Dubai is booming. Abu Dhabi has, is, is, is going ahead with its, uh, with its project. Saudi Arabia is, 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 is actually expanding uh, its economy. Employment is happening in the region. Brain regain to the Gulf is happening. People like you that are graduating are coming back home, are coming back home. The Levantines, the, the, the people of the Levant who, are, uh, who no longer travel west, even though some of them will do, they are, going, they are being attracted to the neighborhood today. You will come to the Dubai Internet City, to the Dubai Media City, to Dubai Financial, uh, the IFC, the Dubai uh, Financial Market, and you will sit in any cafeteria or walk down in any of the streets, and the mix of talented Arabs across these streets is incredible. Pan-Arabism is happening in the Gulf today, ladies and gentlemen. The mix of people, the Syrians, the Lebanese, the, uh, the, uh, the Palestinians, the Saudis, the Emiratis are working together and are thriving and building successful businesses in the region. So there is something that is happening. What do we need to do more to make this even a bigger, uh, a bigger issue and, and address other than the challenges that we talked about in terms of education uh, is, is three or four things. So, and we ask entrepreneurs in some of the research that we do in, in WAMDA, and they tell you there are four things that they need to do to start building their businesses. And I think this is a general thing that is global, but let's talk about it in the region. One is access to capital, obviously. There isn't enough venture capital in the region. There is name lending. They will give money as much as the big companies want, and, uh, uh, but if you're a small and medium-sized company, or if you're an entrepreneur, or if you're a startup, you need, banks will not give you money, forget it. I mean, don't even try. You need to bring your mother and your father with you so that they can, uh, so that, uh, so that they, can, uh, they can guarantee that you will really pay for, uh, and, for, uh, and for mortgage that debt. Home. And or mortgage your home or mortgage, mortgage your car. Fine. I mean, entrepreneurs will, will do that. But banks are, are, are as, if, as if this 70% sector does not exist. It, it, they are the biggest employer. 75% of the employment in the region happens with SMEs. So again, there is a disconnect on, on, on how are we addressing the issue. So access to capital, access to finance, access to debt for these SMEs and for these startups. Number two, they tell us it is access to markets, and we talked about it. I am unable to build my business, and I'm, I'm unable to, build my, uh, to sell my product across geographies. There are restrictions. Number three, they tell you they need, uh, they, 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 they have a basic skill problem in how to actually market their products. It's a skill. It's a skill issue. They say, I'm building my business, but I don't know how to sell my first, my first. I need to know how to actually attract clients. 
skill. This is a private sector. Can, mentorship can help them in, in doing that. St skills in, uh, in, in schools can help them, uh, can help them do that. <coughs> Basic stuff. And, and every entrepreneur, 70% uh, of entrepreneurs we asked uh, said if we had, a uh, every, sorry, 70% of companies that had mentors told us uh, had a much easier way uh, and had access to capital much in, much in a much easier way than people that did not have mentors. So again, private sector engagement and uh, entrepreneurial uh, society. So what I'm saying to people like you that are studying in such incredible institutions in the West, there are things happening uh, back there. There is plenty of employment. There are 150,000 Saudis, I am told, on scholarship uh, by the government in the West, if not in the US. The, that, uh, the, the job market requires you. The, uh, the mismatch that we talk about is a mismatch that is domestic. It's what the domestic education system is producing. But you, when you guys go back, you are going to be even way ahead from the expatriates that are, going, that are being employed in your country. Nothing against exp expatriates, I am one of them. But you need to go back and, and actually take, claim your job, claim your home markets. Uh, don't be afraid of it. I mean, there are opportunities. Again, don't fall into the trap of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of being too comfortable in, 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 mar in, in countries that are too far away from your homeland. So, uh, you are needed to go back and actually, and actually do. And there are institutions, there are organizations that will allow you to do that. So there is, it's a must. I mean, it, 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 I will go as far as saying it, also, it all depends on you, actually, in coming back and doing and changing what, 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 uh, what the region requires. And, and, and I think, you know, uh, on, on that point, um, uh, if I were to think about, you know, one element that, that should excite everybody here. I think the impact that each one of you here can actually have back in the region and the impact you can have on the societies over there is much, much more than a similar job would allow you to get uh, in, 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 you know, in, in the West. Because you know, uh, we are starting from a much lower uh, point and uh, the kind of things that we do there and the impact that they have on, uh, on societies and on the industries that you work in, is, you know, we restructure industries over there. Here we structure companies. Uh, we restructure societies over there. Here we, we, we kind of work on much smaller issues because of the stage of developing of, of countries in the West. So I think it's, it's, if, if you like to have really impact on the societies you work in, then definitely, you know, going back is, 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 is the way to go. Um, a very, I think, targeted question to you, Fadi M, is where do you see the consulting industry going in the Arab world? Okay. Um, so listen, I mean, I think uh, again, I think you know we, we need to put this this question um, in the context that the consulting industry in the Arab world is not going to be dissociated from what's happening in the consulting industry globally, uh, especially not in the kind of consulting uh, that we do. And and what we see happening uh, globally in the consulting industry is that clients. Uh, are increasingly uh, asking consultants to deliver uh, results and outcomes, not just advice. And, and consequently, for companies like us who are strategy consultants, we're increasingly seeing our clients coming to us and, and saying, listen, giving us the advice is, uh, is, is great, but we really need your support in actually implementing uh, what you're recommending and showing us the result at the end of the day. And what that means is that the industry globally is actually um, uh, transforming very quickly as we speak. And you're seeing uh, different players in the industry come up with different solutions to, to bridge the gap between strategies and executions. And I think that that, that trend in the consulting industry is gonna make its way uh, you know, to the Middle East because the same companies that are gonna be transforming in the West are also gonna transform uh, in, in the Middle East. So, I, and I think that trend is, uh, is there, and if anything, is gonna accelerate. And I think we're, we're, you know, we're likely to see a lot of changes happening and uh, different plays happening in the consulting market over the next couple of years. And a lot of, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs are graduating from consulting companies and building businesses, actually. So it's a good, it's a good way to start. <laughs> A lot, I'm, I'm serious. A lot of the startups that are coming specifically in the Gulf 
are actually graduates of big consulting companies who feel that they have learned, and, and it's a fantastic education. Uh, you, you get to build skills that are, and get exposed to different businesses, and they eventually feel that they want to, they can go out and build businesses, actually. Fadi, it's a question for you. So hi, Fadi, to you're awesome. You just spoke about that. Is this a boy or a girl? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Which I didn't ask is, Fadi, if you're not married, would you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that one. Um, so it says you spoke. I'm allowed for. So. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, <laughs> that has nothing to do with entrepreneurship. <laughs> So the question asked, you spoke about barriers to success in the region, region for entrepreneurs. What are patterns you've encountered in successful companies? So um, I, you have to repeat the question. <laughs> <laughs> you spoke about barriers to success in region for entrepreneurs. What are patterns you've encountered in successful companies? Uh, so successful companies are stubborn ones that think the barriers that I talked about are, are not relevant and they, they walk through walls. Meaning, meaning, so I'm, I'm serious. So they, they, these are people that say, okay, we're gonna jump, we're gonna build our business, and we're gonna work along the way in, in, in conquering these hurdles. And there are plenty of those people that have gone out and, uh, and done it. So even though we talk about uh, government regulations, yes, there are people that will go out either lobby government or find loopholes in the system, and we, are, we have plenty of loopholes in the, in the system. So don't shy away if, if the, the, if, if the barriers are too high, there are many people that have actually gone out and, and, and done them. So stubborn, uh, uh, thinking long run, thinking building a business, no hit and run, uh, staying uh, the course. Uh, I mean, these are, uh, these are people that are, we have uh, May Habib here, which we are going to hear about later, is, is, a, is, a, is a woman entrepreneur that has built, uh, is building. Uh, Cordoba, which is a fantastic uh, crowd sourcing, and she's coming up with product. I, I, you will explain later what you do. <laughs> but uh, uh, May is, is from Tripoli in Lebanon, right? And she, she, is, she was a banker in the Gulf and uh, became an entrepreneur and is building a fantastic company. And she found many hurdles. One of them is me. And, uh, <laughs> and she went out and actually built a business and found different ways to, to make sure that she survives. She continued to raise money. And despite all the problems that, that she faced, she is actually going to Silicon Valley now. So uh, doable. And she can explain better than I do uh, in, in, in how you actually conquer uh, the challenges that the, region, uh, the cha uh, that the region has. And she is a woman entrepreneur. And she employs a lot of women that are, do not necessarily work out of offices. So, it's, it's, she is embracing the current wave of working from where you are. If you're at home, you can work. If you're a homemaker and you have a skill, you can actually use that skill to, to, earn, uh, to earn a wage for yourself and be productive in, in society. And that's one of the solutions, by the way, back answering to an old question, mm -hmm. or how do we bring women to the, to, to, uh, to the workplace. So, uh, uh, and, and there is a market. You have to believe that there is a market. You have to believe in the region. I mean, the entrepreneurs that made it said, here's our home country, here's our home region, and we want to stay in it. And we want to build in it. And we, we will ignore the risks that are, are out there. We will ignore the security issues that people talk about. And we will continue to build the businesses. And the people that stayed actually are the people that success, are successful in the region. Nothing against the people that say, OK, we're tired, and we want to go west, and we want to succeed. And many Arabs that have immigrated have, have done brilliantly in, in Silicon Valley and in, in the west. Uh, but again. We're talking about the Arab world and how we can make it happen over there. It's, it's doable. There, you, the, these hurdles are conquerable. I think I'm going to end with the last question, and that's for both of you. Um, what are the legal stepping stones an entrepreneur faces in the MENA ecosystem? What are reforms needed to build a strong legal system for entrepreneurs? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you, you give me tough ones, huh? <laughs> Look, I mean, uh, the, the, um, in, in principle, on, on the legal side, I mean, the, the issue is really not about legal um, uh, constraints into, into startups. 
Uh, I mean, of course, you know, it's not as easy to start companies and all of that, but I think, you know, we've learned how to get, get around that and start companies. I think the, the real issue is, uh, is really that, um, as Fadi mentioned earlier, you're working in a very fragmented uh, environment and your markets are very fragmented. And when you start a company in one jurisdiction, uh, uh, scaling it up across the region into multiple jurisdiction is what starts causing all the legal hassles and, 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 and the legalities that, that you get into. So until we actually get to a stage where you have uh, a common market uh, and, and the legal structure around that common market to allow for the free flow of, of goods and people and services, uh, then, then that's something that you'll have to, to deal with. Uh, it's not a constraint, but you know, it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's difficult to deal with. I agree, and there are four, four, simple, four, four clear issues. One is, again, uh, ease of access to capital, ease of entry and ease of exit, ease, ease and cost, low cost. Startups require low cost. I mean, Dubai is a beautiful city, but it's expensive to set up a business for a startup over there. So if you want to encourage a mass movement of building startups, you need to have ease of entry, low cost of, of entry. Uh, you need to have access to the internet and broadband at a very low cost. The Arab world does not have, uh, that has broadband, but it is at a high cost and it's not, I mean, I'm amazed at how fast, I mean, I, I, I download all my films when I come to the US. So that <laughs> <laughs> because it just takes, so it's, it takes me 20 minutes in the, in the highest of speeds to download one film on iTunes while in, 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 in here, yeah, yeah, this morning I downloaded the film in five, in five minutes and, and that's, that, that's required and in, in the, if you're building, a, not only films to build businesses. <laughs> and, and number, um, so, and, and access to, uh, you, yeah. <laughs> access to markets, we said, is, 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 is essential. So capital, markets, and, and, and we need to also understand that uh, entrepreneurship is learnable. So it's a skill, uh, uh, the entrepreneurial mind is a mind that, is, that learns critical thinking, that learns problem solving, uh, that learns uh, uh, various, uh, various uh, 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 technical skills. These are skills that work ethics uh, is, is, is a skill that you learn at school. It is not, you're not, it's not coming from, uh, you're not suddenly wake up one morning and you think that you're an yeah. entrepreneur. So uh, the entrepreneurial culture is something that is required for us to be instilled in our education system so that our kids, when they graduate, uh, can, they, they will be better employed, employable people if they think uh, in a critical manner and in a problem-solving manner with, with the other basic skills rather than just graduating with the technical skills that they have. And this is a big miss that we don't have in the region. Well, thank you both for this thank amazing you. discussion. Thank you.